today, and maybe um, there's some college graduates here, but also could make a case that almost all of us are on uh, the verge of or just coming out of some kind of graduation throughout our life. Because a graduation is really just a transition um, that we move on to something else, either to more school or a job or whatever, and there's always places in our life in which we're moving from our life looking like one thing to another. And it, I think there's some point in our life where when we're young we think high school graduation might be it and then it's everything else is the same. And then later on it might be college and then it might be uh, getting our career oriented job and then it might be getting married and then it might be having kids and then it might be getting kids out of diapers and then it might be getting kids into school and then it might be getting kids out of school and on and on. That's as far as I've gotten. Um, but I suspect from talking to lots of people, it never really stops. And then your kids go through all of those same stages, and in some senses you go through it with us. But even if you don't have kids or you haven't been through all those stages, life is constantly changing, and we're moving from one place to another. Um, and I want to make a case that the Bible says that although this may be the picture that we're talking about today, there's always a place in which God reminds us in a new phase, a new transition, a new outlook on life, that there are some things that we are called to do and to be. Um, and in just a few verses from Colossians, I want to read some of those instructions given to these people. And without talking about the whole book uh, at length of time, we may be missing out. And I'm going to say this is not the end-all, be-all. Really, I'm only going to ask you that, uh, to, to recognize two callings um, for each of us, two missions that God has given to us. And I'm not by any means saying this is the exhausted list, but they encapsulate two really important aspects of following after God. So let's read beginning with verse 2 in chapter 4 of Colossians. Um, keeping in mind this is instructions um, to us. Verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. May God bless his word for us today. You know, when I was thinking about this, this really is a missional calling. That's kind of a new word um, in the last oh, decade or so in the church, particularly in the United States, about being missional or mission-driven. And what that means is, is that Christianity is not uh, only something that we do. It's not activities. It's not attendance at anything. It's really who we are. And so wherever we go, whatever we do, in all places, at all times, we are called to be missionaries and we have a specific mission that we are deployed to do. Well, it reminded me of uh, a couple of different things and you may know this from one um, era or another. You may remember back this far to Mission Impossible, the late 60s and early 70s, um, what an interesting cast of characters that was. But that music that plays, and if you know Mission Impossible, you can hear it in your head. And as it began, that little fuse that's burning uh, across there. Now, in a later generation, um, you may know this guy um, also as a Mission Impossible. And he's four or five movies deep um, into that uh, now. But Mission Impossible always included um, this, particularly in the TV show, uh, it would say, um, uh, as always, um, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. You remember that? But then it goes on to say this, as always, should you or any of your I am force be caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. This tape will self-destruct in 10 seconds. Good luck. I like that as the premise 
for a movie. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. And I've liked the, I've even watching uh, reruns. That, that show uh, was a little before my time, but I've seen many of those TV shows from the 60s and 70s. And I've seen a couple at least, maybe three of those movies. And there's something intriguing about this almost impossible task. Um, but there are people who are willing to sign up for it, who are willing to sacrifice life and limb for the betterment of the country, of the world, or whatever it might be. And of course, um, as a typical man too, there's always really great gadgets that go along with this that um, whether they actually exist or not, it's nice to imagine a world where you get all these really fancy toys to accomplish your mission. But it got me to thinking too, just this simple question, what is your mission? Now, that I know of, nobody in here has probably gotten a secret tape in the mail when you plugged it in. It said, this is your mission if you choose to accept it. By the way, if you get caught, we don't know anything about it. This tape will self-destruct in 10 seconds. Good luck. But, do we have a mission? Do we have a calling? Do we have instructions on who we are to be and what we are to do? You know, in those movie and TV show situations is these people don't ever seem to have a normal life. It's every single part of the aspect of their life that we see is completely involved and revolves around this mission. We don't ever see them lounging at the beach. We don't ever see them just having a casual dinner where something's not going to explode or come crashing through the door. But the reality for them, at least in their movie and TV lives, is they have to give everything to it. I don't think that our mission is any different from that. In fact, I think we serve a, a much, much higher calling than that. And I think we even have a better uh, system in which we're called to do is that the, the one who calls you to this mission will certainly never disavow um, you in any way. That if we uh, serve according to the mission God has laid out before us, he will always be there. In fact, he's promised that he will never leave us or forsake us and we don't even need that good luck at the end of it because if he's always with us he already knows the outcome of that mission but what is it that God may be calling us to well I think there's really two simple things that I want to point out today from these really brief verses that we looked at and it's just these two things that we are called to pray and proclaim and I particularly want to, to call upon um, Bo and Alex today to really contemplate um, God's call upon your life at this new transition in your life. Of wherever you go and whatever you do, God is calling you. I'm sure of it. There's a lot of things I couldn't tell you I'm sure of about what God has for you. But I am sure that God is calling you to these two things. Just as sure as, I'm, uh, as I am that everyone in here is called to these same two things. Wherever you are and whatever you do. So let's look at this first one. Pray. What is it that these verses tell us about prayer? Notice again in verse 2 it says... Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. There's three things just in that one verse that it tells us about how we are to pray. We are to be diligent in our prayer. Notice it says, devote yourself to prayer. Now, if I ask you, give me a list of the things that you are devoted to, how long would that list be? I bet not long at all, would it? Devotion strikes some chord in us. This isn't just something that I'm interested in. It may not even be anything just because I'm good at it. Devotion means I really believe in it, I care about it, and I'm willing to invest lots in it. And I bet for a lot of us, we could probably count on one hand or less what we're really actually devoted to. Well, when he says be devoted to prayer, he means be diligent in it. Give yourself to it. Really commit to this thing. And I'm going to tell you, I, you know, I've never heard anyone say, you know, one of the biggest struggles in my Christian life is that I just pray too much. I can't get past it, that I just can't stop praying. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I've yet to meet somebody that says that. How could we be overly devoted to prayer? How could we give ourselves too much to prayer? The Bible, in fact, says pray without ceasing. And so 
Is there ever a case in which you could say, I could pray too much? Now, there is a time in which we're called to do other things other than pray, and we're going to talk about that, but prayer has to be a foundational activity in our life. It's the, in fact, I read where John Piper said, it's not a leisure inter intercom where you call to the kitchen for something that you need. It's a battle walkie-talkie where we get our marching orders from the general. Um, and if we really believe what the Bible says about God, what the Bible says about us, and what the Bible says about the world that we live in, we have to be in constant communication, that prayer will absolutely be essential to us. We will be devoted to it. It also says that we are to be watchful. It calls us to a certain kind of awareness in our life about what's around us. And I've made a case over the last couple of weeks, too, that there's sometimes we just don't pay attention to what's around us. And if you've been one of those people, and I've been at places in my life where they say, well, if I start to pray after about five minutes, I start running out of things to pray for. You ever felt like that? I also know sometimes for us we start drifting off to sleep after five minutes of prayer. Um, there's lots of ways in which we could be instructed on our prayer, but one of those things, if you want a fuller prayer life, be watchful, be aware of the things that are around you. You'll never run out of things to pray for if we'll just open our eyes. I don't mean we have to go far and study the world around us. Just look deeply into the mirror and our list will be pretty long. And then you look around your own household and I bet it'll get even longer. You look around your own extended family. I know if you look around your church family around here, you know we need a lot of prayer. Sometimes it just takes asking God at the first part of our prayer, open my eyes and my heart and my ears to the things that are important to you and they come flowing out as the needs come forth. So be diligent, be aware and watchful. And lastly, it says to be thankful when we pray. I don't know about you, but things that you get um, encouraged by, the things that you get uh, rewarded for, are hard for us not to continue to do. Um, and prayer should work that way. When we are thankful, when we are grateful for answers to prayer in our own life, it spurs us on towards that. Um, now, I want to use an example that I'm not encouraging you to go out and try this necessarily, but if you happen to find yourself in, in a casino, probably by accident, I'm sure, you just stopped in to ask directions, um, but you went in there and you saw a slot machine, sometimes called the one-armed bandit. There's a reason they call them that, right? But if you just dropped a quarter in there, just to donate because the casinos need your money sometimes, um, but you put it in there and you pulled it and $10 worth of quarters popped out, and you thought, wow, well, that was interesting. Well, you take another one, and you put it in there, and ten more dollars falls out. And you take another one, and ten more dollars falls out. How long are you going to be there? Probably a good while, right? Well, I hate to use such a crass example for such an important one, but shouldn't it be that way in our prayer life? The more we pray, and the more we see God at work around us, that out of thankfulness, out of anticipation, out of gratitude for what God is doing, that we're encouraged in it to do it more and more and more. And just like it takes open eyes and open ears and open hearts to see the needs to be prayed for, often it takes the same open eyes and ears and hearts to see what God is doing through our prayers. Oftentimes our prayers are not answered exactly like we wanted them to be answered, but they're answered oftentimes in even a better way. So we could talk hours about prayer, but just at the beginning it struck me that he says, be diligent, be aware, and be grateful. And then he says, what we are to pray for. Notice what's first and foremost on the apostle's mind as he writes to this church. He says, pray that God will open a door for the message that is, the mystery of Christ to be clearly proclaimed. What is first and foremost on his mind as he goes to the Lord in prayer is not for himself, not for his own situation. He says, pray for open doors so that the message of the gospel of salvation will have entrance into the hearts and lives of people. And he prays that it will be clearly proclaimed. I'm going to ask all of us today to make that a matter of prayer. It's a foundational thing to our Christian lives is that we pray that God would actually open the door to use me. If you can pray that prayer, I've been encouraging that for two weeks now, even when we talked about helping 
uh, the hungry and doing acts of mercy. And when we uh, talk about how we can invest ourselves in the lives of other people, we start with prayer, asking that God will open those doors. And then to follow that, we have to ask that God will give us the eyes to see the open doors. So we could say so much more about praying, but if nothing else, that we ask God to give us the lenses through which we look at the world, the same eyes that God has for the world, that he would give us those things. And prayer would be that foundation. Secondly, is that we would do something called proclaim, that we would make proclamation of the gospel. Now, I realize when we say we need to proclaim something, um, you think about something like this, standing behind some pulpit, podium, something, speaking into a loudspeaker and proclaiming it in a loud voice. That can be part of proclamation, but I suspect that for most of us, proclamation rarely involves any kind of public speaking. There's not a single person here that is not called to proclaim the gospel. And Bo and Alex, wherever you're going in your studies, whatever you do after college, whatever you do for the rest of your life, you may not be called to be a preacher, a teacher, or anything that looks like standing in front of a crowd, but I do know this, you are called to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as are we all. And so, what does proclamation involve? I think it's really simple, and it even comes through somewhat in these next two verses, in verse 5 and 6. It, proclamation involves what you do, when you do it, and how you do it. That's pretty much all of us. Let's talk about what we do. Notice that it says that the way we act and the way we speak matters. Look at verse 5 again. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Then verse 6, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt. That's what you do and what you say. So all of that part of the aspect of our lives matters in what we do and what we say. Warren Wiersbe, uh, a Bible commentator and preacher, says this. He reminds us that the practical obedience, that practical obedience means pleasing God, serving Him, and getting to know Him better. Any doctrine that isolates the believer from the needs of the world around him is not a spiritual doctrine. And Wearsby reminds us of a quote from D uh, Dwight Moody. It says, every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. What a great picture. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. He doesn't mean the book that I pick up. He means every word that we proclaim should have work and doing and saying all wrapped around it. That proclaiming is not shouting to people who might be in earshot. It is actually doing and being involved. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. The Bibles that I gave you all this morning are bound in leather. I'm not sure it's shoe leather. Um, but for you to ingest that word and then wherever you go, you leave it in some form or fashion, in what you do and what you say. And Paul says to pray that that would happen. So these two aren't two separate things. We don't just pray and then maybe one day I'll get to the proclaim part. When he says pray for open doors, it means that I will actually step through that door. So we proclaim by what we do and what we say. Then when do we do those things? Um, I've said this myself, I have many people over the years and even uh, recently had somebody say to me, you know, I'd like to do some of those kinds of things, the doing and the speaking, I just don't ever find the right opportunity. Well, I think if we're honest with ourselves and our heart of hearts, then if we don't find the opportunity, we're really not looking for the opportunity. Do you notice what Paul says um, in verse 5, he says, make the most of every opportunity. He takes for granted that the opportunities are there. He just says, we need to make the most of those. If you're looking at a King James Bible, it uses the phrase, redeem the time. I like that word redeem here is that it means that we're using what has been already given to us. We don't have to look for opportunities. They're already there. He says, make the most 
of them. And so if you're like me, there's been a place in your life where I go, I just really don't ever have the opportunity to say or to do anything uh, in the service of Christ. I'm not sure what hole you're living in, but you're missing the opportunities that I know are there. The Bible says they are there. And look, anybody who's um, uh, moved from one part of school to another, uh, these two young men that um, we're honoring here today are entering a place of their life where they're going to meet more people probably than they ever have in their whole life up till now. Uh, this whole huge door is going to open. We say pray for open doors. you got nothing but open doors in the next few years of your life. You'll meet people and learn things and experience uh, different parts of life that you haven't up till now. Those are all opportunities, and we are to redeem those times. Here's one of the best things I read this week from uh, a teacher named John Phillips. He says, we are stewards of our time, which I don't think that comes as any big surprise to anybody. We're given all kinds of things in this Christian life, and we are to be good stewards of them. We are to use them for God's purposes. But listen to what he goes on. He says, time is, not, is, time is a non-renewable resource. You know, we live in a world where people are really concerned about our natural resources. Well, one of our greatest, probably the greatest natural resources that we have is time. There's only a certain amount of it. He says, once it's gone, it's gone. It can never be recalled. We invest um, each fleeting moment with something, even if it's only idleness. Solomon had a well-developed de uh, appreciation for the value of time. Read the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll see how uh, he said there's a time for everything. It was sad that Solomon wasted so much of it in personal aggrandizement and desecrated even more of it by his carnality and worldliness. That Solomon at the end of his life likely is the one who wrote Ecclesiastes and he says, now I can look back and I had it all and all of it was nothing. Only fearing the Lord is what matters. Well, then he goes on to say this. He says, he uses this illustration. What if someone with unlimited resources came to you and said, I want to give you $1,440 a day. Would anybody sign up for that? You know, Keith gave a gift today. If I said, somebody wants to do that for you today, said, I want to give you every single day of your life $1,440. But here's the catch. You can't save it. You can't invest it for later. It has to be spent every single day. It's got to be used. And at the end of the day, any of the $1,440 that's left is gone. You don't get to keep it. How many of you would still sign up for that? I go, well, that's a challenge. I bet I could do it. Well, he goes on to say, do you realize that each and every one of us is given 1,440 minutes in every day? 1,440. That's all you get. You don't get more, you don't get less. 1,440. You've been given that every single day, and it is a non-renewable resource. You don't get to save it up for tomorrow, do you? At midnight tonight, a new day starts, and whatever time you haven't used for today is gone. Now, I realize... No time is literally unused. If you're sleeping, it's used for that. If you're being lazy, it's used for that. If you're working hard, it's used for that. But we can't save it up and say, at a later time, all this time that I've been given, I'm going to work harder at my mission, at my calling. And so your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to take those 1,440 days, or 1,440 minutes of all the days of the year, and we redeem them. We make the most of those opportunities. That doesn't mean there's not built-in time for leisure and rest. Those are biblical concepts. In fact, we have a whole 1,440 days out of 1,440 minutes out of every week that's meant for worship and rest and renewal. God understands how the human body works, but all those days, 1,440 minutes. Are we redeeming them? Are we using them? Are we making the most of every opportunity? So that's when do we do it? Now. Don't wait. And I hope I'll say to our graduates, and I would say this whether you're in grade school, junior high, high school, college, graduate school, or wherever you are in your life, now is the time. You're not being prepared for something later. That we had two of our 
kids from our children's ministry came up here and helped lead a song in worship today. They're not the future of the church. They are the church. Our junior high and high school students, we're not preparing them for later ministry. We're calling them to a ministry today. And Bo and Alex, when you go to school, whether you leave home or not or move in a new place, you're being called to something today. Your Christian life is not on hold till you get to another place in it. You're being called to do these things today, to pray and to proclaim. Well, how do we do that? The last thing we'll say, it says to us in verse 5 and verse 6, it says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt. There's a word that many of us in the Christian faith today need to hear is to be wise how we treat outsiders. You know, people don't even like to be called an outsider. Our world frowns on insiders and outsiders today. But the truth of it is, either you're in the kingdom of God or you're not. And God says to those of us who proclaim the name of Jesus and, and by faith trust him for our salvation, he says, you are in the kingdom of God, but be careful how you treat those who are outside of it. And boy, do we mess that up a lot. How many of us cringe when somebody says, do you know so-and-so did this, said that, whatever it might be, and we know they have not represented who Jesus is in the way we wish they would? How many of us have really cringed when we realize I'm the one that didn't represent Jesus in the way that I should be? Be careful, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, and then let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt. There's no reason that believers can't speak in a way that's interesting, witty, tactful, and appealing. It's such a disservice to Christ when Christians repel other people. When we speak and act in such a way that people say, if that's what being a Christian is, I don't want any part of it. The devil has enough tools at his disposal. He doesn't need what we do and what we say to add to it. Let our conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt. Be a person of grace. It's what drew people to Jesus, that Jesus exemplified grace and what he did and what he said. It didn't stop some people from hating him, but it drew sinners to him. The ones who needed Jesus the most were the ones who wanted to come nearest to him. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That do we realize that we can speak the words of life and death to people every day, everywhere that we go. Mark Twain said that he could live for a whole month on one good compliment. When our speech is seasoned with salt, all the things that are true of salt, it preserves, it heals, it draws out the best in people. That's what our speech should be. That's the way we treat other people, the way we speak to other people, ought to draw them in. You know, there was a famous book written about how to influence people, to make friends and influence people. And there's some good things in that book, but I think we could boil that principle down if we would do these things. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and let your conversation be full of grace um, and seasoned with salt. There's the key to good quality relationships for people both in the church and out of the church. And so in this transition, our graduate's life, but for all of us, wherever we find ourselves tomorrow and next week and next month, that's our marching orders. That's our mission is to pray about these things and to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with eyes open to see that God can do all these amazing things, not just in us, but through us. And I'll close with this. I read a story about a woman named Janice Munson. Um, this was a number of years ago, but she and her husband were on a shopping trip in Littleton, Colorado. And as they were on a four-lane street, um, two on one side, two on the other, and they were passing, they uh, noticed um, a car had moved from the oncoming traffic to, uh, or from the traffic going the other way into their lane. And they began to pull out of the way, and it was traveling very slow, but cars were having to divert off of the road to avoid them. And as the car got almost to them, Janice noticed that the person in the driver's seat appeared to be asleep. 
And without even saying a word to her husband who was driving, she jumped out of the passenger seat, ran to the car, and began to run alongside the driver's window, banging on the window, screaming, wake up, wake up. And she kept saying over and over, you're going the wrong way, you're going the wrong way, you're going the wrong way. She realized that the person wasn't asleep, but she was unconscious. She was able to get the door open, literally jumped on top of the person in there, was able to hit the brake, put it in park, and diverted a disaster that was waiting to happen for a head-on collision. What did Janice do? She made the most of the opportunity that she had. She saw something that needed to be done. She saw a life-saving thing, and whether she knew she could do it or not or thought she would die trying, she said, I have to do something in this situation. That's really our mission if we choose to accept it is to do something. Yes, we should pray about it. Yes, we proclaim it. Yes, we should do it in the way that the Bible describes, but I feel like so many of us, we just do nothing. And I can tell you there are many uh, times in my life where you look out people who are headed to destruction and sometimes my reaction is, man, that person's going to kill somebody. And it never occurs to me to seize the opportunity, make the most of this, redeem the time that God may have called me to this place for this time for this situation. You may not be faced with life and death on the road today, but you're faced with life and death with every person that you meet. The power of life and death can be in the tongue. And our job, our calling, our mission today is to proclaim that there is life in Jesus Christ and death without him. Wherever we go, whatever I do, that's my mission. And can we ask that God would accomplish that in our eyes, in our ears, in our hearts, in our hands, in our feet, and that he would do those miraculous things in us and through us. Can we pray? Our Heavenly Father, it is our great joy uh, to serve the living God, the risen Savior in Jesus Christ. We thank you that your Holy Spirit resides in us, and I pray that our eyes and our hearts would be open to see the desperate need for a Savior around us, that there are those who are hurtling towards destruction, and we have the power of life and death in our own hearts, that we have uh, the giver of life in Jesus Christ. And I pray particularly uh, for our graduates, for Bo and for Alex, that you would impress upon them the opportunity and the calling that they have uh, to pray for the kingdom of God and proclaim the good news of the kingdom and that you would put them to work uh, in this mission that we're all called to do. And so we give them into your hands. We pray the same for ourselves and look for you to do those things in us and through us today. And it is in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen.